welcome everybody. Thank you for Luca and Georg for arranging this conference. I can just personally confirm that I like the format. And uh, one of the reasons is uh, that I can sit here more or less unshaven and just uh, with a shirt on rather than in a tie and a jacket that gives us much more um, academic spirit in this sense. So um, having said that, um, I'm very happy to present a project uh, to you with, which, we, which, which kept us busy uh, for the last seven months. Um, if I may say so, we are also part of a victim of Corona um, in the sense that our time plan uh, uh, did not work out as we had planned it uh, seven months ago. But I think that is part of quantitative work. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, we try to complete our data set uh, in uh, the months coming up when the respondents are more willing to spend resources on it. Um, Roberta, can you give me the next slide, please? All right, so first of all, we have a surveyed around 120 supervisory agencies in the world in an effort to try to find um, how regulation uh, or how innovation is regulated by these respective supervisory agencies, how much resources they spend on it, and what kind of tools they use for that purpose. First of all, you all have heard about regulatory sandboxes, not only in Salt's presentation, but also in Georg's in, in the morning. And uh, so basically, the sandbox is probably the most prominent tool recently discussed, but it is by far not the only tool. And we try to shed light on the relationship between sandboxes and the alternative tools, as they are. Innovation hubs, their waivers, their fintech charters, um, they're maybe uh, also uh, just exemptions based on size and similar type of features that can be beneficial uh, for very small companies uh, trying to get into the market, trying to prove their business model. In this regard, the approach of our survey is to find the relationship between these tools and how they impact on innovation. And we have also added in cooperation with Luca a few questions on bank and fintech cooperation in order uh, to provide some data on that. Um, in this regard, of course, um, when you survey regulators, uh, the first problem is to make them answer. So far, we have, um, I, I think, 45 uh, complete uh, feedbacks, and we have an additional 13 uh, feedbacks um, which we have received, but which are somehow contradictory and where we are still working on clarifying what the answers mean. And we have another group of targets um, a target regulator is something where we want to get the answer, where we have some personal contacts that have given us uh, a positive uh, outlook on receiving the answer, but we have not yet received the respective survey answer. So you see that we are right now in the range of 56 different supervisory agencies around the world. You will get a regional spread later uh, from us, and we try to move in the 60s maybe even further. How do we do, did that? Um, we have teamed up, first of all, with the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, that is a cooperation of central banks and supervisory agencies, primarily with a focus on developing countries. Uh, and they have around 60 to 80 members, and they were very, very willing to help us in gathering the data. Then um, we cooperated with the European Securities and Market Authority, ESMA, and they were so kind to spread our request for participation in the survey among the ESMA NCAs. That means we had there another 30 authorities uh, that were contacted. And then we have assembled a number of personal contracts uh, to regulators by different fora in which um, we presented in the last years and contact them individually to answer. Um, this is for instance, uh, with regard to Hong Kong, Singapore, also ASIC, the Australian Securities Investment Committee, uh, and this way, we try to more and more or less complete our data set um, uh, around the globe. Um, important is when you do quantitative work, the first is gathering the data set and the second is analyzing it. And um, we are now on the last mile of 
completing the data set. And that means what we present today is primarily um, the type of data sets, how we got them, uh, the true empirical research uh, uh, correlations and similar stuff is in a work plan and we will work on that um, and on the questions that we have um, uh, at the end of the presentation. Before I hand over to Robin now, let me briefly ask the participants if they have contacts to supervisory agencies that they're willing to lend us for a project, they're very helpful for every good contact that is willing uh, to add another uh, competent authority in the field of financial regulation. Of course, the answers must come in a certain format and, and so on. We have there certain quality insurance restrictions, uh, but if anyone of in the call, in the conference is willing to support us after you learned about a project, we're very happy to receive your assistance. Now I hand over to Robin uh, to deal with the background of our research. Thank you. So going to the uh, existing work, first we would like to give you a short overview in what exactly is already being researched in the area of regulating innovation. So there's an abundance of general literature regarding the evolution of fintech, regarding specific challenges of regulating innovation, as well as on the different ways of regulating young fintech companies, ranging from doing nothing, uh, which could be highly permissive or very restrictive, to cautious permissiveness, so case-by-case -case approaches wow. or special charters, to structured experiments like the regulatory sandbox we're often talking about, or tech pilots or other structured projects. So far, the, there is a strong pro, uh, focus we could um, observe on regulatory sandboxes and on innovation hubs or on both in the existing literature. Regarding existing empirical literature, there have been studies by CGAP and the UNSGSA, but they had a focus on the impact on fit of fintech on financial inclusion, so they were a bit narrow. Others, like the European supervisory authorities, solely focused on specific geographic regions. Um, all of them share that there was no full disclosure of the exact methodology being used or the exact questions being asked. And from the literature, we concluded that in the current debate that we're having, there is a lack of an overview of most of the world's important fintech jurisdictions, the specific challenges they face, and how these jurisdictions approach these challenges by means of regulation. Next slide, please. So our research tries to fill that gap. And first of all, it aims at combining a survey of financial supervisory authorities with doing our own research of publicly available information, which is what the innovator would access when interested in guidance on regulation or other matters. Second, we aim at using a truly global approach. So the goal the goal is to do research across regions and across networks. We want to include developing countries, developed countries, and we want to allow for an analysis of regional specifications. Third, we want to be able to analyze not only the most pressing challenges for supervisors and, of course, for the fintech companies. In the end, we want to actually indicate whether or not different regulatory approaches are effective for maybe every jurisdiction or maybe for specific regions or specific budgets. So to summarize, our goal is to finally identify one regulatory framework or a combination of regulatory frameworks that can work best for regulating innovation with empirical means. So now we start with uh, presenting the main research questions. Uh, the full study has been built on five main, uh, five main uh, um, research, uh, research questions. And uh, here we have a summary of uh, the survey questions. 
Uh, with the first question, we aim to find uh, uh, one or more substitutes, uh, if whether one or more substitutes, uh, uh, excuse me, yeah. And we aim to find that if one or, or, or more substitutes for sandbox uh, can achieve the same effect as a sandbox. And uh, when we refer to effect of a sandbox, uh, we refer to the outreach and in terms mainly on, on, of numbers of fintech firms involved in a specific uh, sandbox program or substitutes program. For substitutes, uh, we mainly mean we selected a, a group of uh, uh, regulatory pro-innovative tools uh, like innovation hubs, uh, fintech waivers, no action letters, and tech pilots. With the second one, with the second research question, we wanted to focus mainly on jurisdiction and uh, we want to find whether uh, countries uh, with a sandbox program in place can uh, somehow perform better or worse than other countries without a sandbox. And here uh, we uh, again think about performance in terms of adoption rates and outreach in, of fintech firms in a given jurisdiction. With the second research question and I mentioned precondition for a successful sandbox, we want to basically find what are the major precondition and the main precondition for a success for a sandbox to work successfully. With the third research dimension, the cost of a sandbox, we mainly want to try to find the resources and the cost of a sandbox program to work, uh, to operate efficiently. And for this reason, we mainly focused on the number of staff of, uh, that is needed for, uh, to, for a financial supervisory authority uh, to uh, operate efficiently. And for this, we looked at the number of uh, staff dedicated in the sandbox program in the substitutes and also in the FinTech de departments in the different uh, supervisory authorities that uh, were our respondents. Uh, the fourth research dimension re relates to the fintech ecosystem in general. Uh, we included also a number of survey questions uh, related to the functioning of the fintech ecosystem in terms of how uh, financial supervisory authorities actually promote and communicate with fintech innovators and also how they organize themselves uh, within the financial supervisory authority and also uh, outside, uh, but within the same jurisdictions. And uh, with the last uh, research uh, dimension, we wanted to focus, as we already said, to the cooperation on the cooperation between uh, regulated and uh, fintech firms. Here, uh, basically, as we said, the, um, uh, the, the research has been based on a survey, mainly so far. Uh, we started actually with uh, some, um, uh, some semi-structured interviews uh, to test the ground, and then we proceed with a survey, with an online survey tool. Uh, we gathered the data starting with uh, an Excel database. And here we have our preliminary results. We will follow the same structure of the research dimension. Uh, here we wanted to focus, we wanted to start our analysis uh, of mapping um, the adoption of a uh, regulatory sandbox and also other substitutes like uh, tech pilots, uh, fintech waivers, no action letters, and uh, the main substitutes, uh, substitute innovation hub. Here we have noticed, uh, noticed firstly that the majority of the authorities that have a sandbox, a regulatory sandbox in place have also actually adopted other substitutes for sandbox that are listed here on the left. But at the same time, we notice that uh, also half of the respondents have also no regulatory tools in place which is also a, um, another uh, way to promote fintech innovation in the country in the different uh, jurisdictions more and more popular nowadays. Uh, we also tried to uh, combine our survey data with also um, desk research and uh, here we wanted to use or consider also as a country performance indicator, also the number of fintechs accepted into regulatory sandboxes and also 
and uh, compared them with the, with the fintech firms consulted, with a number of fintech firms consulted within innovation hubs. And we uh, have noticed by looking at the number of uh, um, uh, fintechs uh, sandbox within uh, the um, FCA that uh, we have about 120 sandbox firms versus 56 uh, 56 thousand fintech firms uh, um, consulted within the innovation hub. So the number of uh, fintech firms uh, um, of, uh, within the sandbox program is much lower than number of uh, firms uh, consulted and advised super in the innovation apps. And it's actually these data are in line with, the, uh, with our survey data, uh, of course, in a different scale, because this is uh, uh, very um, dependent on the kind of jurisdictions involved in the, in the survey. As an alternative country performance indicator, here we have used the time required for obtaining a banking license. We have, sele we have selected the, um, countries with a sandbox and countries without a regulatory sandbox in place. And uh, we have noticed actually that regulators with a sandbox have a process that takes between one and six months while only 25% of the jurisdictions without a sandbox have a process that lasts only between one and six months. Of course, this can depend on many other factors that we will test as the next steps. Also, as we said, um, country-specific challenges and features of the ecosystem might affect the choice of one regulatory approach over another one. We assume that the regulatory tools are, um, have to respond somehow to pressing issues for fintechs. And as a first step here, we have tried to identify the most pressing challenges for fintech firms. And uh, uh, what we emerged from this first analysis is that um, the majority of the financial supervisory authorities that, that responded to our survey have uh, uh, indicated a lack of clarity with regard to re regulatory and licensing requirements as indeed the most pressing challenge. And this actually emphasized the need for more publicly available guidelines for uh, mainly fintech firms willing to approach the financial system. Um, while actually the financial supervisory authorities claimed a lack of clarity as uh, the most pressing fintech challenge, at the same time, only a very small number of regulatory sandbox may be considered transparent. Uh, for this analysis, we have basically um, uh, combined our data with publicly available data. We have, not, we have tried to uh, build a transparency score uh, that uh, averaged about 42%. The transparency score was built on uh, different factors uh, that included uh, um, that were, were basically 28 data points between uh, um, transparency of regulatory uh, requirements, entry requirements, and so on. Uh, these findings are actually um, this, uh, this number, this average of, uh, of the transparency score, which is uh, which was 42% is in high contrast with the responses that we got from the financial supervisory authorities in our survey. Uh, they basically stated that 100% uh, of them stated that uh, their entry requirements were publicly available. And uh, we actually, to, to further examine this lack of certainty of, on fintech regulation, we also um, uh, tried to combine our, uh, to, to try to match the fintech firms that were within the regulatory sandbox, UK regulatory sandbox, with uh, some financial categorization. And we noticed that the majority of sandboxed firms uh, were actually um, part of a broad catch-all category, uh, the financial intermediaries not elsewhere classified. And these basically show how that the fintechs actually cannot define the nature of their business by using traditionally established categories. And so um, this supports actually the claim that many respondents 
uh, actually that the regulatory frameworks may fail to clearly guide financial supervisory authorities in innovators in the licensing process. And also here, as I argued before, an explicit fintech strategy and a clear national policy are um, really fundamental steps and preconditions in the development of uh, a fintech framework, including a regulatory sandbox. And as a first step, we try to identify the most common fintech services per region. Uh, we uh, found out that payments uh, actually is the most common type of fintech services uh, reported by our financial supervisory authorities that responded to the survey. Uh, generally, even if the underlying reason of the provision of fintech service may vary, may vary a lot among um, the jurisdiction, um, we notice that uh, actually uh, there is a quite similar distribution of uh, uh, fintech services across the geography studied. Overall, we have 24% of the respondents that also identified blockchain, uh, crypto asset and crowdfunding related fintechs as uh, particularly relevant across uh, their countries. And uh, uh, this is uh, in line also with, uh, with another section of, uh, of the questionnaire uh, where uh, we asked for the planned fintech regulation to support uh, the, and actually this uh, supports this uh, finding. And in particular, Africa, uh, Asian, uh, African and Asian countries are still planning to adopt rules on this, uh, on this uh, sector, blockchain, distributed ledger and peer-to-peer -peer lending. All right, so give you, to give you some preliminary findings with regard to size, first of all, the disclaimer, the size of the financial market is not yet included in our analysis. So we are still waiting for some delayed answers due to give it COVID-19. After this, we will have a full picture and we can do a full disclosure. But what we can say so far is that when looking at sandboxes throughout the jurisdictions, they are between three and 10 employees working directly for the regulatory sandbox of a given jurisdiction. Um, when looking at fintech departments of regulators, they are staffed with between two and 30 employees. Our first observation here is that all jurisdictions with a more developed fintech framework, with a fintech policy in place, had at least 10 employees, indicating that established independent fintech units with like several full-time employees, a certain amount of uh, employees could be an important prerequisite for functioning fintech. Next slide. Another factor we um, had a look at is the accessibility of the regulator. So throughout jurisdictions, so far 71% of respondents have either a fintech department or fintech working group. In addition, 82% of respondents disclosed they would discuss licensing matters on the phone. However, this is under the discretion of the individual employee and there's no clear policy adding in unclarity. Also, some regulators require some information first. Next slide. So after identifying the right person, engaging in a call, the next, next step would probably be a formal meeting on our day, a video call. And um, most FSAs require some more detailed preliminary information here, like a short business plan and a justification for the meeting. Next slide, please. Looking at the cooperation between banks and fintech companies, our first result is that the vast majority of FSAs does not grant any regulatory advantages to bank fintech partnerships. And um, 36 of the respondents even stated they would put a special focus on certain risks in addition to the ordinary supervision. However, the majority of regulators does see advantages of this form of cooperation. Next slide. The results indicate that there are clear advantages for all stakeholders. So the banks, they enjoy an enhanced access to the deep tech expertise of the companies, the clients, profit from enhanced market access, broader supply of financial services, and the firms and banks have an ac enhanced access to data, data analysis due to their collaboration. Next slide. 
But what about banks on fintech project, projects? We analyzed publicly available uh, information and we found out that most sandboxes um, or at least 16 jurisdictions explicitly allow already authorized institutions. So could that be the solution? Okay, I, I was told to wrap up. So we believe that benefits like data and knowledge exchange can't be enjoyed by internal fintech projects. So we don't think that this is a solution that fintechs, uh, that banks put fintechs in their in sandbox, their own projects. We, um, drawing from these results, we think that regulators could do more to promote bank and fintech cooperation and the introduction of specific programs or mechanisms to facilitate cooperation is uh, to be further investigated by the regulators. So let me very quickly, one minute, tell you the next step. We will go into correlations. First of all, we have completed the data set. We will test a number of correlations, try to find to what extent uh, these factors um, are connected. Of course, we have a number of uh, uh, different questions in this regard, uh, which we want to pursue, which we laid out in the paper, and I refer to that. And uh, as a takeaway uh, so far, um, which is surprising because we have surveyed the regulators, is that the lack of clarity of rules seems to the main impediment, not only from the side of the fintech firms, but also from the side of the regulators. And those are, for the most part, those who make the rules. Yeah? And uh, this is a bit of a paradox, yeah? because at the same time, they say they have disclosed all the rules on uh, the sandbox and the innovation hub and whatever on the websites. Uh, so there seems to be a contradiction in itself, uh, which needs to be solved. Um, another part of our conclusion is that apparently um, the sandbox is an indicator of general innovation activities. Uh, Roberta, can you please go on the last slide? Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there is some uh, uh, um, effect of sandbox in the way that signals a certain commitment. That's something that we expected uh, at the marketplace. And uh, we have also seen uh, that this commitment is usually coming with more people, more resources, and so on. And because we have surveyed a lot of countries around the globe, um, we have some countries with very little resources. And even there, we sometimes found a huge fintech departments. Um, overall, I think there's another takeaway for the topic of our conference, because everyone sees bank fintech cooperation as beneficial, but no institution, no NCA is really taking measures uh, to make them easier. What could be a way to do it? Uh, there could be an indirect way of the reporting. There could be a kind of um, uh, limited type of uh, uh, supervision uh, for these cases. So I, I can imagine a number of indirect subsidies for this type of cooperation, uh, but uh, this is uh, not being the case. So it is yeah. fruitful to think about it. Now my last a slide is just for you to see, and then we can start into the discussion because that's a regional spread. You will see here the respondents, um, our targets in green, and uh, the red ones where we expect answers in the foreseeable time. And that's it. Thank you very much for your patience and your attendance. Thank you. And uh, Hilary, please, uh, the, the floor is yours without further ado. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, I have no slides, so uh, this is all you get. Um, so first of all, um, I want to applaud your attempts to get more data in this area. Um, it is a place where empirical data is sorely lacking. I will be a greedy and grateful consumer of this data. And I think policymakers in general will be. I mean, they're typically flying blind when they are trialing new regulatory approaches. And we've actually you know, gotten to the point where regulators are now now revising their approaches to fintech regulation without really having had an opportunity to assess the, the first round. So I think, as I said, that the data is, is sorely needed. Um, gathering empirical data is a Herculean task. Uh, it's going to be made even more complicated by the current global pandemic. I wish you all the best with this. And unfortunately, I don't have any good methodological uh, suggestions for how to overcome these difficulties. I, I know you'd made a note in your paper to that effect and I've got nothing for you there. Um, my comments are more about which questions we should be trying to answer with empirical data. 
rather than the way such data is gathered. Although I do have some suggestions as I'll go through my comments about places where I think you can supplement um, your survey questions. And I did note from a comment in your, um, your draft that you plan to distribute follow-up questionnaires to the various FSAs. So hopefully there will be an opportunity to gather extra data points that pertain to the questions that many policymakers want answers for. All right, so the research questions that you're trying to answer with this paper and this data all seem to be related to determining the best way for regulatory agencies to further fintech innovation by the private sector. Um, so what's interesting to me is as far as I'm aware, and, and you can correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong on this because I don't have the same sort of global knowledge of all the different jurisdictions, but my sense is that most financial regulators around the world don't have a mandate to promote innovation. That's not part of what they're tasked with doing. So some regulators have mandates to promote competition and efficiency. Um, and you know, I think you can reasonably tie um, policies to promote innovation to those mandates. Um, but some regulators don't even have that. And more to the point, um, innovation does not always equal improved competition or efficiency. Um, so what I think is important is to see research questions oriented instead around, around whether policies to further private sector innovation further the goals of the financial regulatory agencies themselves. Um, you know, a useful categorization of these goals um, I draw from the principles of financial regulation book that, that Luca um, co-authored. You know, if we have regulatory agencies around the world World trying to promote consumer or investor protection um, or financial stability in addition to the market efficiency and competition I've already mentioned. How will these particular regulatory tools further those regulatory goals? Because I think ultimately that's what regulators and lawmakers around the world want to know. Um, when I've engaged with, with regulators and, and lawmakers, they sort of, they seem to be wanting to engage with the threshold question, which is, in light of the limited resources that are available to regulators, are sandboxes, hubs, whatever it is, a good way to further their goals as regulators? Um, I don't believe that this survey really gets at that question. It does pick up um, pieces, hit, hit, uh, bits of pieces here and there. But I think your answers that you're generating with these questions um, will be helpful to policymakers that have already committed to the promotion of private sector finance, uh, fintech innovation as their policy goal. Whereas there are many who are still trying to figure out, well, you know, how should we be engaging with innovation and why and what does that do to our other mandates? Okay. Um, so to that end, um, I fully expect that you will be fleshing out um, your literature review in more detail in, in, in later drafts, but I do want to point out some of the deficiencies I see in it in, it, in its current form. Um, so you do sort of nod to some of these other regulatory objectives. You briefly talk about market integrity, um, citing Chris and Yesh's paper, um, but you only sort of briefly nod to the risks for regulatory goals like financial stability and consumer protection. Um, the Magnuson paper that you cite to regarding financial stability risks um, does not um, in any way give a comprehensive survey of these risks. It, to my mind, I'm full disclosure writing a book of the impact of fintech on financial stability, so I have a lot of thoughts there. Um, but the paper doesn't at all get into the risks of some of these innovations for consumer protection. And there's been a robust literature developed there about, um, you know, discrimination, um, predatory behavior, et cetera. Um, so if the goal of your paper is to link the research on fintech innovation with the research on, um, yeah, sorry, the research on innovation with the research on regulation, which you said you articulate as one of the goals, I think you need to engage much more deeply with why we might regulate fintech in the first place and how those considerations should influence any policies to promote fintech innovation through the regulatory system. Okay, so coming back to the, the survey itself and the questions you're asking, um, here are some of the data points I would like to see more on if we are to answer this first order question 
of the extent to which regulators should be engaging in this type of private sector innovation support. So I'd like to learn more about the information sharing or educational aspect of these programs like sandboxes and hubs that's sort of often been cited as their redeeming feature in many respects, that they allow regulators to learn about new technologies and that that will help them discharging their core mandates. Um, so do the FSAs feel that, you know, this is a good and you know, useful way to learn about the new technologies? Do they feel that compelling disclosure from firms about their technology would actually be a more cost effective or feasible way of learning about the new technologies? Um, would it be more comprehensive to do it that way? So the thing about these innovation hubs and, and regulatory sandboxes is that they are self-selecting, right? Only firms that want to engage with them regulators do. So that leaves out a large swathe potentially of um, fintech firms and there, you know, the regulators may not have any insight into their new technologies. So should something more um, structured in terms of, um, in terms of disclosure regulation be required to educate regulators. I want to, I'd like to hear the thoughts of regulators currently participating in these programs as to whether they feel that they're really getting the information that is effectively the, the quid pro quo of the um, regulatory relief that the firms are getting. Um, I'd like to hear how FSAs are recording or using the information that they glean from these programs. And how are they memorializing it? Um, are they using it to develop broadly applicable policies? Um, I'd like to know how they're sharing that information. When it comes to international cooperation, are these FSAs sharing information with their colleagues around the world? Or is it sort of traded, treated more as a trade secret and is it being kept confidential? Remember, this is sort of a new place for um, regulators to be in, right? They've always collected commercially sensitive information from um, the people they regulate, but they've used it typically for the purposes of examination enforcement. This is new for them to be actively using it to sort of promote innovation that changes their role. Does that make them less likely to share that information with other regulators? Um, I want to know about where FSAs are getting their resources um, from in order to engage in these programs. So you've asked about the costs of sandboxes in terms of personnel, et cetera. But I would like to hear to the extent that FSAs are willing to talk about it, are those, where are those personnel coming from? Are they being diverted from other areas of the um, agency? Are they being hired at the same time as other parts of the agency are being retrenched? I think that's a useful data point. Um, and then just in general, I'd like to know if the FSAs feel that they have sufficient resources to discharge their regulatory mandates in the context of these new programs, right? So for example, the FSA sandbox um, you know, has consumer protection measures built into it. Do regulators feel that they are able to sort of pursue and police those consumer protection measures in the context of their sandbox? That's just one example. So that's, you know, by no means exhaustive, but these are the, the questions that sort of came to mind as I read the draft about sort of what would I really like to know from the regulators um, who are doing these things if I were trying to figure out whether I myself in X country were to adopt a policy um, uh, to promote private sector innovation. Um, returning, however, to the initial research questions um, that you're trying to answer. So this is once we've accepted that we're going to put in place policies to promote financial sector innovation, sorry, um, private sector innovation, how do we do it well? Um, I have a couple of, of um, comments on, on, on your data points there. So as you acknowledge in your draft, um, success in innovation isn't purely a function of the regulatory environment. Um, there is a robust literature on the conditions for successful innovation. This is not my field in any way, shape or form. Um, the scholars I'm most familiar with in the US are Elizabeth Pullman and Anupam Chander. Um, but I think you could look to that literature to determine some of the variables you're going to need for, to control for 
in comparing the outcomes in different jurisdictions. So you've mentioned that your sort of goal is to come out, and I think I heard you right, to, your goal is to come out with you know, one single framework that is the best way to promote um, financial innovation by the private sector. And I suspect that that literature on how to promote innovation more broadly will tell you that there isn't one single framework that is going to be right for every jurisdiction. Um, I think that literature will also be helpful to you in some respects in controlling the perspectives of the regulators themselves. So you've noted that the vast majority of the FSAs um, identify a lack of clarity with respect to regulatory and license re licensing requirements as the most pressing fintech challenge in their respective jurisdictions. It doesn't surprise me that regulators think that they're the center of the universe, right? When they're asking, when you're asking about, you know, if you're asking a regulator what they think the problem is, it's not surprising that they're focused on regulations. Um, they could be wrong. I think the literature on successful innovation might yield more insights on a whole range of reasons why um, innovation might be stifled, which might have a lot less to do with regulation than the regulators themselves think, you know, things like um, availability of venture capital, et cetera. Um, so my summary is that this is a Herculean effort to gather very much needed data and it will be very welcome. But given the amount of work that you're putting into getting this data, I would like to see questions submitted to the FSAs that get at the really fundamental issue of whether given the scarcity of regulatory resources, the FSA should be focusing them in programs that promote innovation by the private sector in in, in a, as opposed to thinking about other ways to dealing with um, fintech. So those are my comments. Hopefully I didn't go on for too long. Thank you, Hilary. Uh, Dirk, Roberto, Robin, would you like to quickly respond? We have uh, two minutes before uh, we start the panel. So I will not take any questions, unfortunately. Okay, good. Thank you, Hilary, for your comments. Couple of things. Um, our questionnaire already requires 40 minutes to 60 minutes of regulatory time. Of course, our wish list is much longer, but um, practicability and uh, self-reduction is a way to get any answers from them. Uh, second, uh, we have not expressed that there's one single way across country, but we look for local optima. We just try to find the factors that allow for optimizing uh, the approaches to regulation. On the regulatory mandate for furthering FinTech, um, yes, indeed. That's a point. We have certain questions into that direction. Uh, but again, we had to limit ourselves. We have already more than 60 questions asked and, and we have questions that lead to results in that regard. Um, we have, as to systemic risk and so on, and also your critic that I have not expanded on doctrinal literature. I think we have contributed a lot on the doctrinal side ourselves. This paper uh, shall take a quantitative approach. Um, of course, even if we start presenting our results in a comprehensive fashion, we will be in a very high number of pages. And I want to keep this project very, very disciplined just on the numbers side. Um, the people who deal with these numbers can, of course, uh, then draw conclusions from them. We try to make them uh, transparent as much as possible. As to your sharing of information, that's an interesting question. We have a number of questions on how they're sharing. We know from a few of the things, we know the AFI working groups, we know the ESMA uh, uh, consultative working group, where also Luca and I sit in. So we have certain formats where they share information um, that is also tested empirically so that we ask for the memberships of these groups of the FCAs. And so we will have some information there. Interestingly, if everyone shares, and this seems to be at least for many jurisdictions a case, then we should ask ourselves why. And the one reason why they share is because none of them has really control over the respective risks that come from that. And uh, in this regard, I fully agree that there are a lot of risks coming from the innovation and so that regulation is necessary. But I think that we have expressed that in many other papers already. And um, so we try to keep it here really on the facts and the numbers side. I think that's from my side. Look, I hope I stayed in the two minutes. <laughs> 